this meeting is being recorded. Um, so if you're not comfortable being recorded, um, don't turn on your video. Um, and uh, we're on Twitter and we're on Slack. Um, and if you're not on those things, um, please join us. We always ask, remind people to support the Drupal Association. Even your um, you know, small contribution per month uh, makes a difference. Um, you, we tend to take drupal.org for granted sometimes, um, but if we don't have drupal.org, um, then our modules will be scattered all over the internet like some other uh, open source CMS platforms. Um, and that won't be nearly so convenient. Um, and uh, for those of us who maintain modules, um, we get the testing suites, um, you know, automated testing running on all of our updates. So there's a few things coming up. Um, uh, Drupal Camp Asheville, uh, if you're in the south southeastern United States, I think probably will be online, so you could probably be anywhere in the world. Um, a decoupled days is definitely online. It's officially a New York event um, in the sense that it's hosted in New York, not by members of our organizers, but uh, we're fond of it. Um, and because it's usually in New York at John Jay College, but this year it's online. Uh, and uh, we're, we have a group of organizers working on Drupal Camp NYC um, for October. Um, it's targeted to be a hybrid event and uh, you can find more information online. And we also have an organizing channel for the camp um, or you can email camp volunteer uh, and um, help us do that. So uh, we have a website, drupalnyc.org. Um, uh, it is a Drupal website. Um, it is a Drupal website that I threw together on a Sunday afternoon because um, we were moving up from one hosting domain to another and it just didn't seem right. We were on a GitHub like .io page for, for a while. It just didn't seem right that as a Drupal meetup that, we, that our web presence wouldn't be Drupal. Um, but I threw it together a, on a Sunday afternoon. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, it could use some real thought um, and a real theme, um, not sort of a, a, a slightly extended uh, theme I found on drupal.org. Um, so if you are interested in working on the Drupal uh, website, uh, join our website improve channel. Um, uh, we're grateful to Oliver uh, today, but we also need speakers every month for this uh, event. Um, if you've learned to do something recently in Drupal, um, you could share it. Um, uh, and also uh, uh, our evening meetup needs speakers, just email speak at drupalnyc.org. So um, we invite anybody who would like to introduce themselves. Um, I'll start. Um, my name is Sean Duncan. Um, I work as a technical architect for, Drupal, for a digital pulp here in uh, New York City. And um, I am the chair of Drupal NYC Incorporated. And, and I've been coming to Drupal NYC meetups um, since 2009. Hey team, my name's Jed. I'm uh, here in New York. I'm a longtime Drupal uh, backend developer. I work in the healthcare industry. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Vivek. Uh, I'm a PHP Drupal technical architect with Accelerant. Uh, I'm, I've joined in from uh, Pune, India. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've been following Drupal NYC for uh, some time and I've been working on Drupal as well for quite some time. Uh, yeah, good to see you all. Oliver, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, okay, I, I, I can't, uh, because I'm looking at an iPhone, um, I can't see gallery view or much else, but uh, my name is Bob Phelps. I um, uh, was going to group of group, groups maybe six, seven years ago and um, learned a lot enough to make um, uh, simple concept sites that kind of work and that's all I really need most of the time. Um, uh, occasionally I might want to, you know, do something a, a little better and a little more secure. And uh, that's something that I would like to learn more about if only to um, um, you know, in, introduce the sites to people uh, more gracefully. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm a hobbyist that, that you know, sort of remembers Drupal six and seven, uh, eight, nine, and you know, 
when I get the urge, I will make something and then um, show it to people and say, isn't this a great idea? And Drupal is very, very good for that, but it's very obvious, uh, especially as it evolves uh, uh, with um, things like, and I, if that's Jake Rockowitz back there, hi, I don't know, someone with a beard, uh, especially when it became even easier uh, to, um, uh, you know, create sort of database-like uh, things and forms without having to um, do a lot of reading or thinking, uh, spectacular work. Uh, so um, as Dribble matures and as I mature, uh, I'm uh, getting into the point in life when I may actually start to make things that, that work somewhat. And uh, I mean, for, since this talk is a bit about staging, I discovered Bitnami long ago and uh, um, amazingly the thing survived you know moving from one macbook to another all old macbooks that i inherit from my daughter and um, i'm intrigued by uh, learning much more about you know how, how professionals work when they stage and uh, you know develop and uh, you know communicate with um, the, the the various uh, you know large uh, uh, in, in the sky uh, operations. So that, that's, a, that's a longer introduction than probably I should have given, but thank you for your forbearance. Well, I'm David J. Chen. I'm actually connecting in from Peru where I work for a Christian mission organization. And we've got a couple of websites that we, we look after as part of this project. And we sometimes um, have specific projects where we, where we have some um, smaller Drupal sites. Excellent. Are you the presenter today? Uh, no. So oh. no, Sean's the MC. And uh, Oliver is our presenter. You can pres you can introduce yourself now, Oliver, or when you start your talk, whichever you like. Um, yeah, I might as well do it now, I guess. Um, I'm Oliver. I'm based in the UK. So I've got a real international flavor <laughs> with this meetup today. Hey, all your, your audio is feeble. I don't know if it's just for me or everybody no, else. I was just about to say your audio is quite low. If you oh. if volume or something. Yeah, Any better now? Oh, yes, that's much better. Oh, yes, okay, yes, very good. Right. Yeah, so I'm Oliver, I'm based in the UK. Uh, I currently work for a, a company called Transport for Wales. Uh, so I started there a few weeks ago. Uh, I've been doing Drupal for about 11 years full time and a bit before that as well. Uh, I did a talk for NYC previously, uh, which I can't remember which one that was. I think it was Drupal 9, uh, a great talk. And I did a, a workshop for the Drupal Camp NYC last year as well. Thank you for joining us today. I'll, I'll remember glad it is a more civil hour for you. <laughs> yeah, that helps. <laughs> yeah, it's not like midnight or 1 a.m. or whatever it was last time we did. Okay, um, let's see. Um, so that's a good segue into your talk. So I'll stop screen sharing. Okay, let me just get my glasses a quick clean. See the screen myself. All right, you got a kite. Okay. Do we see that? Do we see slides or do we see notes? No, we see, we see slides and uh, I think we see everything. Slides. Okay, I'm slides. trying to see which screen we're sharing. So I'm not entirely sure. Hopefully, we should see the one with uh, just the slides and not the notes. Well, I think I've got I think I've got three things on the screen. I've got your it's sharing slide. everything. I've got your next slide. Okay. As well. Let me just say, you didn't ask me what I wanted to share, which is a bit strange. Uh, yeah, it just seems to be sharing everything, which isn't what I want. That's strange. Usually it says, which screen do you want to share? Yeah, I got that when I tried to share. Hmm. Let me just try to stop sharing again. Uh, does anyone know while, while we're doing this does anyone know how you get rid of the gray 
nonsense above and below when you're doing a Zoom thing with iPhone. It, 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 the one above just says Zoom and gives me options to leave. Yeah. No idea. No, okay. I, I think it may be, maybe not something you can get rid of. It, 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 it crowds the slides. Oh, here we go. Okay. Now I've got a slide, Oliver, and I've got your, uh, looks like a, a terminal. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I think we've got this hopefully figured out now. Yep. Yep. Got it. It. Got it. Looks All very right. good for me. <laughs> okay. We don't need that one. This. Okay. I've got this slide. I think that's the one that we need. What is Ansible? What is Ansible? And now it's not changing there. Oh, this is not going well today. Okay, now it's gone. Okay, I've got a terminal. Terminal. Let's boot that back up again. I've got a slide. Okay, now I think we. All I right. think we're right. I think changing that. Yeah. Okay. I think we're good. That was weird. Okay. Yeah. As we said ten minutes ago, <laughs> my name is Oliver, and yeah, this talk is deploying PHP with Ansible and Antistrata. Okay, so there's three things we'll be looking at in this talk. First, we'll be talking about what Ansible itself is. Then we'll be looking at Ansible's Vault, and then a tool that's sort of an add-on for Ansible called Ansistrana. So what is Ansible to begin with? Uh, it's an open source software, software provisioning, configuration management, and deployment tool. Now, I found that Ansible mostly gets talked about in terms of the software provisioning and the configuration management. So setting up the service, deploying the service onto DigitalOcean or Linode or EC2 or any of the sort of cloud hosting providers or for the configuration management side of things or the actual installing of packages. So installing PHP, installing MySQL, installing uh, Nginx or whatever. But I don't find it gets talked about as much as a deployment tool, which it can be useful. So once we've got past the provisioning and the, and the configuration stuff, we'll talk about deployments a bit more today. Uh, and if we're used to using something like Acquia or Pantheon or uh, Platform.sh, it's likely they've already got things like this sort of built into it. You can declare your uh, hooks or your build or deploy steps. This would be more useful if you're deploying to VPSs or, or bare metal servers or something in the cloud or Maybe you've got a, a client server you, you deploy to, which I do have for a couple of things. So Ansible itself is a command line tool. Uh, you install it through Homebrew or apt or whatever your package manager is, and then you run it inside a terminal. Uh, it gives us various commands such as Ansible and Ansible Playbook, Ansible Galaxy. Uh, we'll see some of those later on. Uh, we configure it with YAML. Uh, it's written itself pretty much entirely in Python, but you don't need to write Python to, to use it. It's pretty much exclusively uh, YAML build. Uh, it's agentless, which means you don't need to install anything on the servers that you're managing. Uh, unlike some other tools I've used previously, where you have to install uh, software on the servers in order to connect to them. Uh, as long as there's Python and there's an SSH connection, you can run Ansible commands on it. Uh, you can use Ginger 2 for templating. So if you're used to writing Twig, you'd be very familiar looking at uh, Ginger 2 syntax. They're pretty much the same thing. Uh, I think they were actually fall from the same repository at, at one point. Uh, I've seen a talk where someone has sort of Ginger or Liquid or something on one side and then Twig the other side. You can't actually tell <laughs> that they're different. Use it for execute, executing ad hoc commands. So you can just say Ansible run something uh, just on a server. This was quite useful uh, when we had Drupal Geddon a few years ago. I was maintaining a, a few client sites on, on my own servers back then. Uh, and it was quite good. I could just run a command and just say download this patch and run it against all these sites. It worked really well. Uh, there's also things like how much free memory or disk space to my servers will have. You could just run any command you could run inside a, a terminal. You could just run through Ansible as well. Uh, we use it to install software packages, so things like Apache or MySQL or PHP for our pretty typical sort of Drupal stack. 
Uh, we can use it to perform deployment steps. So there are modules included for things like Composer and Git that we can use to actually deploy replications as well. And by Ansible modules, these things are all included. So some of the pack other things that we've used before, you don't have access to all these uh, extra modules and, and things that we can make use of as Drupal and PHP developers. So why Ansible? Uh, for me, it's a familiar syntax. So as I said, it's mostly using it with YAML. Uh, we write a lot of YAML with, in Drupal 8, and then when I'm working with Symfony or, or Sculpin, which is a, a static site generator that uses some of the Symfony components, they basically, basically all use YAML too. So it's familiar to me. Uh, when I've used other things, they're written in Ruby or they're written in Python, and then like, those aren't my primary languages. So I need to go and figure out what's going on there. It's not as easy for me to just read at a glance and figure out what's going on. Uh, because they're easily readable, uh, anybody can look at, anybody working on this project can take a look. So I tend to keep playbooks inside the code repository. So anybody who has that code checked out also has the, the deployment playbooks and the provisioning playbooks. So they can go through quite easily, just skip through and figure out what's going on quite easily. Uh, as I said, there's no server dependencies, so we can just install Ansible on a laptop or on a control machine uh, and just execute commands remotely without needing to install loads of things on the, on the remote servers. And I've been very, I've been able to add uh, Ansible playbooks like this very easily to existing projects without any, any problems. Uh, as I said, it comes to the number of modules and things included. So things like Git and Composer, uh, that we'll see later on. Uh, one thing that Ansible uses is idempotency, which means it can run the same command uh, multiple times and get the same result. So, for example, uh, we're going to say we're going to make our project directory on the server. What we're actually saying is we want a directory to be there called this. We're not saying make a directory. So if we run it once, it will look and say that there is no directory it will create it, then the next time it doesn't create it because it's already there. So I don't need to say, does this directory exist or not? We already get that sort of for free. So it means that my Ansible playbooks are much cleaner than yeah, some other tools I was using before, whereas having to make these sort of checks manually. So that's why I've been using Ansible recently for projects. So let's jump into sort of the Ansible 101. So first up, we have hosts and inventories, and these are our way of telling Ansible where our servers are that we want to work on. So I'll use these two words interchangeably as we go. I think they're pretty much the same, essentially the same thing. Uh, so we have a file here called host.ini. So there's two ways of declaring a host file. One is using this ini any style syntax, where we've got the, the square brackets that are declaring our groups. So we have a group here called web servers uh, with an IP address. Uh, this could be a, a host name as well. Uh, it could be a range of host names, but a range of IP addresses. Uh, and then our second group there is defining some variables for our web servers group. So here we're saying we're going to connect on port 22, uh, which is the default for SSH. And we're also going to connect as the OP Davis user. So real simple sort of host file here just to connect to a a vagrant box that I was using at the time. Uh, the other option is to use YAML again, uh, which I sort of prefer because it's more consistent uh, with the rest of my Ansible code. Uh, but also if we're copying variables from playbooks we'll talk about later on, we can do that quite easily. We don't have to re-indent, re reformat them. So this is the same, the same host file, just in a different format. So it's a little bit more verbose. We've got a little bit of nesting going on I do have to usually look at an existing playbook that I've done uh, or, or Google Ansible YAML syntax to sort of figure out where the, the children keyword and, and things go, but usually it's, it works fine. So that's fine. So this is our two ways of telling Ansible how to, where our servers are, how to connect to them. So now we have that, we can use ad hoc commands. So by that, I mean that we have uh, an Ansible command Let's just see whether I can move zoom. There we go. That's probably a little bit better. Okay, so we have a, an Ansible command. Then we're going to say which 
hosts to run against. So this is all hosts. Uh, in this example, we could also use web servers for our web servers group. I believe it could also be a, a host name as well, if you want to run on a single host. Then we're going to specify dash i, which is our inventory file, our host file, which is host.yaml that we just saw. And then dash m is defining the Ansible module we want to run. So in this case, we're going to run the ping module. So just to connect, just to make sure we're able to connect to our servers. And this is the output that we get. We can see uh, Ansible is going to try and grab some facts from our server. So we can just find Python that, like I said, it, it needs Python in order to run. Uh, then it's going to say change false because we haven't changed anything. And then we've sent a ping and we're getting back a pong. So if we get in this type of response back, we know that Ansible is able to connect to our servers. We don't have to connect to a, our ports are correct, our keys are correct, and that all that type of thing. So this is good. And you can see right at the top there, we get web servers uh, pipe success as well. So we know at this point we're rocking and rolling, we're good to go. So another way we could do the same type of thing, uh, we can use a module here called the command module. So any command that we could run uh, on the command line, we could use as the command module. So dash M command in this case. And then we just pass through dash A, which is a set of arguments that we want to run. So when I talk about the Drupal get and stuff, like this was saying, um, yeah, download this patch and apply this patch to all these, all these projects here. Yeah, but in this example, we're just going to say run uh, a git poll uh, on the server inside this slash app directory. So dash dash ch is, is change directory. So we're going to change into slash app, which is where our application is going to live in this example. And um, we're just going to run a, a git poll. So we could, in fact, if we had a code base on the server already, we could run a really ad hoc deployment just by running this one command here, just to pull down the latest, the latest code. Uh, as I said, there are a number of built-in modules like the, the Git module. So this is another way of writing the same thing using the Git module rather than the command module. So you can see we've got dash M Git now. So we're using the Git module and our list of arguments is, is different. Uh, they're all key value pair arguments. So our repository is this GitHub URL, which is the Drancible project, which is the Drupal Ansible demo. Because yeah, uh, and then again, we're just gonna stage it into the same directory and run it. So these two commands pretty much do the same thing. Uh, although in fact, this one would look and try and clone the repo and other things as well, if it didn't already exist. Uh, and there's other arguments we could pass through, things like make sure we've got the latest commit, uh, which branch we're on, that whole type of thing. But these are some useful defaults, or minimal defaults. Okay, so we can connect to our servers, we can run commands. Uh, let's have a look at some playbooks. So playbooks are uh, a collection of commands in a YAML format. So here, uh, our YAML file starts with our three dashes, and then we have a list of plays. So we could have multiple plays in the same playbook. And we start off by defining our hosts. So I have our, our web servers group here in this case. And then under vars, we can define some variables. So we can take that git repo URL that we had in the previous slide, store it here as a variable. We can then also have a project root dir variable, which is our slash app directory. Uh, and then we can, inside our tasks, use that double curdy brace syntax. At some point, I need to learn what the correct name is for that. But for now, we'll stick with double curdy brace. Uh, and again, this is very similar to Twig, right? If you're used to using echo route variables in Twig, we do that in exactly the same way uh, using ginch2 in, in Silenceable. So yeah, this is the same command again that we saw in the previous slide, but just done with uh, inside the playbook rather than running an ad hoc command. Okay, so now we have a playbook. How do we actually run the playbook? So we can use the Ansible playbook command rather than the Ansible command, and then give it the name of our playbook. In this case, is main.yaml. Again, you can name it whatever you want. Um, I typically have one for deploy and one for provision. Uh, and then, in this, yeah, again, pass for our host file. Uh, and there is an ansible.cfg command uh, file that we can make. We could specify the host file there. Um, I don't do that here, but typically I would. You don't need to keep adding dash i to everything. But yeah, there we are. OK, 
Okay, so how can we set up a, a, a basic LAMP stack now using using what we know? So we have a file uh, called requirements.yaml file. So think of this as sort of your compose a JSON file or your trash make file um, for Ansible. And here we're going to find some roles that we're going to want to, to pull down and use. So in the same way that we have Drupal.org for modules and packages for PHP uh, libraries and packages, Ansible has a website called Ansible Galaxy with uh, a lot of community-based roles we pull, but um, no, sorry, official and community-based roles there. So Jeff Gerling, who as well, most of us know from the Drupal community, is also a very busy, popular Ansible contributor. So he has a lot of these roles. Typically, if I want to do something, Jeff usually has a role for it already. Um, so yeah, here we can just use uh, five uh, roles that, that Jeff has written, and we can use them to install uh, Apache and then Composer, MySQL, PHP, and then the PHP MySQL uh, bridge. Uh, so these are just namespaced uh, role names. Uh, and you can specify versions here as well. Uh, I do recommend doing that, although you have to specify exact versions of, of, of the roles. You can say one or greater than like we can with Composer. And then roles are just collections of playbooks actually as well. So we'll get to that in a, in a moment, get a little bit ahead of myself. So we have another command we can run here called ansible-galaxy. And we can say install and pass it the requirements file path. So this will go to Ansible Galaxy, uh, download those roles into our machine and we have them locally to, to, so we can run them. Okay, uh, inside our playbook then, uh, we can have another keyword here called roles and we can specify our list of roles that we want to use. So back in our uh, previous, in our requirements file, um, the ordering doesn't matter, but here it does. So I typically like to order everything alphabetically. So Apache would typically go first and then Composer, then MySQL and then PHP. Uh, so it's fine in our requirements file, but here uh, they get run in the order in which they're defined. So Apache is guess it's all first, that's fine. Uh, then in this example, we run MySQL and then PHP, then Composer. Typically, I'd want to put Composer after Apache, and then that would fail because Composer requires PHP, and that wouldn't have been installed yet. So there we are. So in each role, as well as having its own list of tasks and plays that we, like we saw in the, the other example, each one also exposes uh, some variables that we can use. So in this case, uh, the Apache role has uh, an Apache v host variable, so we can use that to specify our virtual hosts. So in this case, we've got one called Drensible as our server name, and then our document root is inside slash app slash web, because we want Apache to lock inside the, um, the web directory. Similarly, we can configure PHP. So in this case, we'll install PHP 7.4. And then we're also going to install some extra packages. And again, we can use that double curly brace syntax here. So we can reuse the PHP version from line above uh, inside the, the extra packages section below. So if we change the PHP version to 8.0 at the top, then it would also work uh, update later on as well. And yeah, these are all variables that are exposed by um, the roles. So when these roles are written, they were set up to have these um, available. And then also MySQL databases, uh, databases and users. So here we're going to make a, a database called main. So just our main database. And then we we'll have some users. So in this case, we'll have a, a user called user with a password that is secret. And then we can set some privileges. So we're saying that this user can execute all privileges, has all privileges on every table inside the main database. Yep. Okay. And then if you have a provision.yaml playbook, we can just run it and that will install all of those tasks, uh, all those variables and install all that software for us. And then this is typically what we see. Uh, we see the start of the play at the top with uh, a little bit of a description. And we can see Lex and Ansible is gonna gather some of the facts that we saw previously. 
And then we can see the roles now starting to run. So we can see the Apache role running first. And the Apache role has different variables depending which operating system you're running on. So if you're running on uh, an Ubuntu or Debian based um, operating system, you'll have different variable names that you would do if you're running on a CentOS or a Red Hat based system. So it looks at which server you're running them on and then finds the right variables for your, your operating system. And then we can see later on, uh, on the sort of the fourth step, you can see here, this is actually being run on a Debian or an Ubuntu server. So we're including those variables. Uh, otherwise it would be skipped like we are on uh, the Amazon Linux one there. And then, yeah, it's gonna carry on just running down this list of things. And I'm gonna to get to the bottom. Uh, then it's lastly going to install Composer, uh, making sure the Composer directory exists. Uh, then we're going to run handlers. So handlers are just signals to restart things, services. So we're going to restart Apache, we're going to restart MySQL and PHP FEM. Uh, and then at the bottom, we get this little recap. So we can see again which groups or which hosts we've run on against, uh, how many tasks ran okay, how many did something that made a change, how many were unreachable, failed, how many were skipped, uh, so on and so forth. So we get this nice little summary at the bottom of, of every play. So now if we were to go to the IP address of this uh, server, you can see we get an Ubuntu uh, page. So Ubuntu is installed, uh, Ubuntu, so yeah, uh, sorry, Apache is installed and running. I was reading the wrong word. Uh, Apache is running, uh, it's installed. Um, that's great. However, uh, if we were to go to the host name that we'd set up previously, um, we'd get a, a pretty cryptic forbidden message. So that's just telling us that we're not able to serve anything from the directory that we've told it to. So that makes sense because we haven't actually put any code there yet. We've said configure the server, we've said install a web server, which is Apache, and we've said install PHP and, and our database, which is MySQL, and we've said install Composer. That bit is all working and fine. So we can see that what we've seen the Apache default page, and we can see at the bottom here it says Apache 2.4. Dot whatever, so we know all that is working, but we don't have any code there yet to, to serve. So uh, we'll start by looking at a basic deployment, and there's some other things we'll sort of circle back to as well afterwards uh, later on. So we have a, a provisioned YAML playbook that's doing our provisioning. So in this case, now we've got a, a deployed YAML playbook, which is going to do our deployment. So this is pretty similar to what we saw right at the beginning. So we've got some tasks. We're going to create a project directory, which is our slash app directory. So here we give each task a name. So in this case, the first one says creating the project directory. And the next key is the name of the module, as we saw uh, at the beginning. So in, in the first task here, we're going to say use the file module. And then the file needs to be slash app on path to be slash app. And it needs to be a directory rather than a file or a symlink or whatever. We're creating a directory called slash app. And that's what I was saying at the beginning is that this is, we're not saying, we're not giving it commands like you would be if you're building a Docker file or something. So we're not saying make the minus P slash app. We are saying uh, we want a directory at this path and uh, behind the scenes it's figuring out what commands to actually run. And then our second step here is uploading our application code. So we'll use a module called synchronize, which is a wrapper around rsync. Uh, which is nice because I never remember how rsync works and I always need to go and look it up. And it's got all the, the letters and flags after it. So usually I'll just reach for this anyway, because it makes things a lot simpler. Uh, and then we get a magic variable here called playbook do, which is the directory in which our playbooks are in. So typically I'll have a, an Ansible directory that keeps all the Ansible code in or a, a tools deployment directory or something like that. So in this, in this example here, we need to go up one level uh, outside of our playbook directory up one level to find our actual source code. And then we go to move that from that source into the slash app destination onto the server. And then finally, we need to install our composer dependencies. So we can use the composer module to run the install command inside that working directory again. So I'll just basically say run a composer install for us on the server, install all those Drupal modules and themes and PHP packages that we need. 
And we can run this in the same way. We can just use Ansible playbook again, uh, pass it the name of the deploy playbook, and then have it run. And then once this has happened, uh, we should get a website that's running. So these initial demos I did on a, on a virtual machine running through Vagrant. So we can see here, it says this site is running on a Vagrant server deployed with Ansible and Ansible's runner. Uh, and the source code for this is on my GitHub if you want to take a look at it afterward. So. Okay, so we have some disadvantages here, right? I'm sure a few people were shouting at their screens already or maybe not if they're, <laughs> if they're unmuted. Um, but last time I gave this talk, people are putting in the chat, oh, he's putting MySQL passwords in, in in, in plain text or, or whatever. So yeah, I'll circle back to that in a minute, don't, don't worry. But yeah, we do have MySQL database names, uh, but usernames and passwords primarily you know, stored in, uh, in plain text, which is bad. Uh, we also have a single point of failure. So everything is inside that slash app directory at the moment. Um, so if our composer install was to fail or something, our site would be down uh, at that point because everything's just in one one directory. Uh, and also we have no ability to roll back really easily. So we did need to go back to the previous deploy. We can't do that very easily at the moment. So first of all, let's have a look at how we can do secret management with, with Ansible's vault, and then we'll get back to the, the deployment part. So th th this is the problematic bit. We can see here we've got, yeah, the database name and our user and our super secret password all stored in plain text. So this is bad. So there was a, 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 another part of Ansible called Ansible Vault, which is there by default. We, we get access to it when we install sort of Ansible, so along with the playbook and the, the Galaxy and everything command. We get Ansible-Vault. And we can use that to encrypt um, variables and secrets. So here we'll make a, a, a new file, new variables file, and we'll call some provision vault.yaml. So it's just another, another YAML file. Uh, and then here we'll put in the secrets that we want to, to keep. So uh, typically I'll call the, all the variables inside the vault, vault underscore something. Uh, just so that when I'm looking at them later on, I know it's very clear that they've come out of, out of the vault. So, excuse me. Yeah, so we put everything in, in here. And then we can run a command like this. So Ansible vault encrypt, uh, and then provision vault.yaml. Uh, there are other ways of doing this. Um, you could just say Ansible vault, I think, create. It would pop a vim or whatever your editor is. You type everything in, it sort of does it for you on the fly. Um, but yeah, you can do it this way as well. We can create it in plain text first and encrypt it afterwards, which is fine. Typically, even if I'm just sort of spiking this out, I'll just do this as a plain text file to begin with and not worry about the vault part until it, I know it's all working. So that's probably why I've started favoring this, this workload. Okay, uh, so once we run that command, we will get prompted for a password. So uh, we need to give it a password and then confirm the password. I know we then put that password into LastPass or 1Password or, or something, and then I can share that with other people on, on the team. So somewhere safe and accessible. And then now, if we tried opening up that provision vault file, now this is what we'd see. So we wouldn't see the uh, plain text variables anymore. We would just see the encrypted, uh, the result of, the, of that encrypted code. So this is fine. We can commit this. We can push this to GitHub or Bitbucket or, or whatever. No problem. Just don't push the key with it. I've not done that yet. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, just jinx myself. Good job. Okay, um, the other thing I usually have is a provision vars file that just maps the vault variables to a, a, a non-vault variable. So this is quite nice. It keeps my variable names a little bit cleaner. Uh, and also I can just see all the variables inside the vault without opening up the vault itself. So that's sort of why, why I've started doing that. Yes, yeah, so we have one variables file called provision vault and no one called provision vars. <clears throat> we can use both of those now as, as vars files, as variable files inside our provision playbook. So we can yeah, include them all as, as vars files. Uh, and then we can use the variables for them inside the, uh, the normal variables. So here we can say MySQL databases uh, is now database name in double curly brace. 
and then MySQL users, we can use again the database name and the user and the password. So those things aren't stored in plain text anymore. Again, we can commit this up into to GitHub and or whatever, and it'll be fine. So that's our first problem sorted out. And I think we get this free as well. It's not like an extra. There are other tools, um, others also called Vault. But for me, it's quite like this does the job for me and it's included for me for free, for free and by default. So we need to make a slight change um, to our playbook um, command here. So now we need to also specify the password to decrypt the vault so we can actually run, run and execute the playbook. So you can add this extra command, this extra argument here called ask vault pass, which was prompt us to enter the password again. We'll enter it and then it will decrypt everything on the fly and, and, and run it. So that's one way we can do it. <clears throat> also, there's uh, another option called vault password file. Uh, and here it's just, we can make a file with the, the vault password in and then Ansible will load it and then use that to decrypt it. So yeah, if you're going to do this, be careful not to commit it accidentally as well, because that would defy the point. Okay, so we fixed our MySQL secrets problem. Uh, we still need to fix our deployment. So here we can use this other tool called Answer Shana to do some better, more robust deployments. So these tools are just, these are additional roles that we can use. So they're the same as the Jeff Gerling, Ansible, PHP, MySQL roles we saw, saw earlier on. Uh, and they're available on Ansible Galaxy under the Answer Shana namespace. Uh, and there are two, there's one called deploy and one called rollback. Uh, and yeah, Ansible is, it says here, an Ansible port of another tool called Capistrano, which is written, I believe in, I was saying it's Ruby, I always forget, but another tool called, called Capistrano. Uh, and this slide is a little bit of date. Um, I checked it recently, I think they're two or three times these numbers now. So it's cool. So what does Answer Shana give us? Uh, we have multiple release directories. So rather than having everything in slash app, we can see uh, we have a releases directory with all of our releases in it. Uh, because of this though, we do need to have shared files or shared paths. So in a, in a Drupal context, at least our settings.php file might be shared. Uh, our files directory would definitely be shared because we need to keep the same files directory uh, across multiple releases and, and deployments. So we want to make sure our images are still there and everything's still there, cache files are still there. Uh, it's customizable, so we can add additional steps and we can configure it as we need to. Uh, we can deploy using Git or Subversion or we probably still use Synchronize modules if we wanted to. Uh, we can configure it to use dev stage prod or any other environments that we want to use. Uh, there's an option to prune the old releases. Uh, well, I've done these types of things by hand before. Uh, with multiple releases, they get out of control quite fast. And suddenly you've got a release directory with hundreds of releases in it, uh, particularly if you're doing like CI, CD uh, type deployment. Um, so yeah, it does handles that for us out of the box, which is nice. Uh, and there is the rollback role as well as the deploy role. So we can very easily roll back to the previous uh, deploy if we need to. So how do we use them? Uh, we can add them to our requirements file, uh, same as we did with the, the girl and guy ones earlier on. And we can just add them into our uh, deploy playbook in this case here. So roles and sort of deploy. And again, similar to how the, the other roles that we saw earlier on, uh, these expose their own set of variables that we can use to configure it. So, Answer Shana deploy to is telling us which directory to, to deploy to on the server. So in this case, it's just that slash app directory again. Uh, we deploy via Git. We're going to deploy our master branch. So this is just a, a reference to a, it says Git branch, but it could be a, um, a tag. It could be a, a commit char uh, if you're deploying individual commits, um, just any sort of commit reference. And again, this is our Git repository. Uh, if you were deploying through subversion or something else, you'd use the corresponding set of variables to configure it. Okay, and now if we run it, we'll see 
um, some answers on our dot deploy tasks being run here. So first of all, we're going to make sure that our deployment base path exists. So in this case, it's our slash app directory. Then it's going to create a recess folder and some shared a shared folder. And they can see that the bottom step here, we can see it's going to ensure that shared paths already exist. So this is what I've already configured here. So in this case, we're saying uh, we're sharing websites default files. So it'll do that for us anyway. And then right at the end here, we can see about halfway down, uh, cleanup releases. I'm just going to prune the, the old release, the release directories out. And then optionally send those stats back to the website as we, as we saw. So pretty much identical to how we saw the provision playbook working earlier on. So now if we go onto the server, or into the Vagrant box in this case, and go into that slash app directory, we don't see the actual application code. We don't see the Drupal code here as we would have done previously. What we get is the release directory and the shared directory. And then we get a, a sim link to, to current. And this is the current active release, the current deployment that's, that's live. So this, if, when it says earlier on that Anstrano is a port of Capistrano, this is the setup that Capistrano uses. So multiple release directories with shared elements and typically a, a current sim link as well. So each release is date stamped. So you can see here, we've got 2019, 07, so July, 2019, uh, 19th of July, 2019, at 12.41. So that was the active release when I, did, when I did these slides some time ago. And then if you look inside that release directory, we can see the other releases we've got in here. So again, they're all just date time stamped, automatically generated at the, the time at which we did the deploy. And then if you do need to roll back, we have the astrano.rollback uh, role. And all we need to do is give it the deploy, the way we're deploying to, and it will figure it out for us, which is the last release and then roll it back. So that's get a, a rollback mechanism in six, seven, eight lines of YAML. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, then yeah, just to run it, we're going to run a uh, rollback.yaml playbook. Uh, which is that I have one for the deploy. I missed up the slide. I wonder where that's gone. It's fine. Okay. So yeah, we'd run deploy.yaml to do the deploy and rollback.yaml to do the rollback. So yeah, as I said, we can completely customize this. So Antishana gives us build hooks. So we have setup which is um, the initial setup steps that it runs, then updates the code, so it pulls the, everything from Git or whatever, then puts the shared sim link in, then does the main sim link, so the, the, the current sim link, so at which point the site is live, and then clean up. So the, the main sim link is the, as I said, is the current one, and that's where we'd point our web server to. So after the main sim link is, is done, that, the site is live. So Ancestrano offers us hooks, uh, so before and after each step that we can use to execute our own things. So we can configure that by adding some additional variables. So we have after simlink shared tasks file, we have an after simlink task file, we have a, an after update code task file here. Uh, and these all point to more playbooks with their own tasks in them. So of course, they, if you wanted to do before, we could do Anselstrano before Simlink or whatever you wanted to do there. So my typical convention is to put them into a, a deploy directory um, and just name them after the, the name of the hook that, that it's running after. Um, because the directories are all date stamped, so we can't we don't know in advance what they're going to be, uh, Anselstrano gives us this Anselstrano release path dot standard out that we can use. And that is the name, uh, the actual path to the, the, the actual release that it's releasing in the process of releasing. So we can use that to find what the, in this case, what the web path is and what the, the Drush path is for this, this release. So yeah, maybe we've updated Drush in the release that we want to make sure we use the, the right version of Drush. So here's some examples of what we could do. Uh, so after we update our code, uh, we're going to want to run our composer install command here, and we can do it inside the working directory for this release. So that's fine. Uh, and then if this was to fail uh, on this step, the build would just fail, 
and the current simlink wouldn't get updated. So we don't have that single point of failure here anymore. So yeah, if it fails, live site is not affected. It's fine. We just end up with a release that's just not simlinked. Uh, after our simlink shared is run, so assuming our settings.php file is, is in our shared files, um, then we're going to monitor our database updates. So here we can use our release trash path and release web path variables just to run them. We're not update db command. And then after our main simlink is live, we're going to want to rebuild, rebuild the cache. So after the site is live, make sure you can see the latest, latest everything. So um, let's see how many for time. We have time. I was going to do. Let's go do a little quick demo here. So this is something. This is my personal site repository. I've got this hooked up to use um, GitHub Actions. So I've been meaning to write a blog post about how I'm doing the integration between the two um, for quite a while, but I will get to it eventually. Uh, and this is actually on my DigitalOcean server. Um, for, for my site. So it's inside this directory here. And then I've got uh, releases and then shared. Uh, we do get a repo because it's from Git. And then the current symlink is going to, to this directory here. So it's this one I did a deploy uh, five days ago. Is that right? Yeah, 06, 10. Yeah, five days ago. I did that one. So what I'll do quickly here is just make a, a new commit. So the way I've got this set up is just to Whenever we push a new commit to the production branch, it will just trigger a, a deploy. So I'll just make an empty commit and push it. Uh, build. Okay, so hopefully what should happen now is we should have uh, another workflow getting started. There we go, so trigger build. So this will take a few minutes to run. We can see it's going to run some checks at the beginning here. So it's going to run my tests and make sure I can build my theme and everything. And then once that happens, uh, it'll do the deploy. So I'll just leave that running for a moment. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. We'll see how that goes. So a couple of things I want to just cover quickly. I know we're still running out of time here. Um, yeah, something I started doing is generating the settings file per deployment. So sometimes I'm putting configuration like webhook URLs, something inside the settings file from the vault. Or something I've started doing is using the commit shower as the deployment deployment identifier, which if people want to see that, that's in my GitHub repo for, the, for this site actually. Um, so what I've written is a role, uh, a Drupal settings role, Ansible, a Drupal settings role for Ansible. So this generates my settings.php file. So I'm again exposing some variables here. Uh, the main one is Drupal settings, and I have a list of, of sites. So this is inside app web, and then it's I'm just building the essentially the settings.php uh, list <laughs> of things. So again, I'm using the, the vault for database names and, and usernames and passwords and things. Um, but the role itself will then take this information and build that settings file for me. So when I was saying that uh, Ansible used Ginger 2 and it was quite similar to Twig, um, this is how that looks. So it's doing some looping over, over things and if things are set and, and falls, and it's building up this, this settings.php file dynamically. And yeah, these are just some of the tasks that that, that role is running. So it's going to make sure that that directory exists uh, using item.1, item.0, passing through some defaults and things as well. Um, and then we're using template module here as well to take that Ginger 2 template and make it into a, a PHP file. And then multiple environments, as I said, we can do. Um, we're using, typically, you'll have at least a staging and a production environment. So in this case, you've got multiple, assuming they're on the same server, of course, you've got two databases, one for production, one for staging. Uh, and then I've got different users for that. So one for production, one for staging again. <clears throat> the way I've been doing this recently is to have two separate sets of hosts. So one here called production, and you can see halfway down, we're going to deploy the slash app, 
which is our app directory. I'm going to deploy our production branch and we're not going to store Drupal every time we do a deploy. Maybe on staging, um, we're going to deploy to a different branch into a different, yeah, different branch on the staging branch into a different directory. And then also we can do Drupal install is true. So maybe for our staging environment, we want to build, build, rebuild it from scratch every time. And then when I'm running the commands, uh, I'm going to use limit here to say limit this, these runs to staging or limit these runs to production. So that's how I've sort of done that recently. Um, let's just see how my deploy is going. Hopefully it's... So Oliver, we have about four minutes left. Um, <laughs> okay, no problem. I'm just any questions of things you've already shown. This is yeah, let's see. Let's say this one. Make sure this works before we <laughs> before we finish. No. But yeah, sure. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to ask now. It's great. So I'm sorry. Yeah. I I joined late, but um, I was wondering, could I use this to um, have a local environment, obviously local, a staging on something like Pantheon and a production environment on some other hosting environment, like, I don't know, uh, DigitalOcean or something like that. Yeah, I don't, it's been a while since I used Pantheon, but I know if I'm using Acquia, it has its own built-in hooks and platform to SH has its own set. So I don't know whether Pantheon has something quite the same type of thing. Uh, you could use sort of the command module just to run terminus commands or to do git push and git pull. Uh, but it wouldn't be this integrated. But typically, yeah, I use this on like my, this is my personal site, and this is run on DigitalOcean uh, at the moment. So, yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, actually, yeah, in fact, I'll jump back here. This is the site I'm running on DigitalOcean. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully, if I rerun this command again. Yeah, we can see now that the, the, the current sim link has now changed from, from 10 to 15. So we can see that, that now that release has, has gone through, um, the, the current sim link has, has changed. Um, yeah, just a quick look on some releases. Yeah, so I've got this set to be five, apparently. So that's cool. That worked. Yeah, I thought this would be useful. I think we after the last meetup, we had we talked a bit about deployments and things. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd do this talk. Agreed, Oliver. This was fantastic. And and maybe it should have been obvious, but what really hit home to me was the fact that it's agentless. That um, and yeah. I, I think that makes it a lower lower barrier of entry to adopt. And um, yeah, I'm, definitely. I'm ready to dig in. I could definitely use this. <clears> so yeah, and and that's nice because it's, it's easier from a setup perspective, like if you're configuring everything. But also, it's nice then you don't need to go through a big sign-off process to want to install. So sort of, when I've used Puppet, which is similar for, for configuration management, you need to set up what's called Puppet Master, and then I think it's a slave or a node. So yeah, you need, but you need Puppet running on both of those things. They need to talk to each other. And it can be pretty complex from what I remember. This was a few years ago. But... Um, yeah, this is really easy. As long as it's got Python, it doesn't. Like, I used Ansible on projects. I didn't know I was using Ansible on. <laughs> it's, well, it's, yeah. I think, that's, I think that's okay to say. Well, and I definitely use Drupal so. VM a lot. So I've seen Ansible yeah. in Drupal VM a lot. But also, yeah. like Ian was saying, you know, maybe not with kind of like the hosting as a product like Pantheons and Aquias, but if you're hosting uh, servers on, on multiple hosting you know, providers like DigitalOcean and, and other ones, Line yeah. Note or something. This seems awesome. This seems like you don't worry about that anymore. You just push it out to it. So fantastic. Yeah, I think particularly if you can take it that little bit first, like I've been doing here and having it set up so that it'll run, like anytime you do a push, and it'll just automatically deploy. But that's quite nice <laughs> as well. So yeah, I just push the code and it deploys automatically. So that's quite nice. And I like the rollback. Yeah, the rollback is nice. It's nice because you can just do it so easily as well. It's, it's not that complicated to set up at all. Yeah. Uh, well, any final yeah. thoughts? Well, I'll make sure I sim link. Uh, I'll, I'll screenshot this and tweet this out afterwards. There, there are some, there's a list of Ansible repos on my GitHub. 
So some like including my site, they used it for deployment. There's some other ones in there. Uh, and then Symphony Cast has, has quite a good um, screen cast series on it, I'm sure as well, which is I definitely recommend checking out. Great. Well, we're so grateful yeah. that, you took, that you gave us the gift of your presentation today, uh, Oliver. Yeah. And uh, uh, we're especially um, especially diligent with the lunch and learn, trying to be on time, start and stop, because people may be <laughs> on the show. Um, so I'll end by saying that uh, we'll be back the third Tuesday of uh, July, and the next event in our community will be the evening meetup on the first Wednesday. So we hope uh, uh, all of you can join us then. Thank you so much, everyone. There. Yeah, excellent, excellent job. Thank you. Well done. Excellent. Thank you. Good to see everybody. See you again soon. Okay. Thanks. And although it would be great to see the uh, the presentation on our Slack channel too. Yeah, no, I can do. I can put the PDFs and some links in there. That's fine. No problem. Okay. Cool. Well, Thanks, thank David. You. Enjoy your afternoon, everybody.